And the title of today's message is Better is the End of a Thing. Better is the End of a Thing. We're going to look at selections from Ecclesiastes 7, Acts, and Revelation, or the Revelation of Jesus Christ, if you want the full title. But I think it's fitting that it's New Year's uh, Eve today. It's the last day of the year. Um, you know, like I said, I didn't really want to do a New Year's Eve message. I feel sometimes that's kind of kitschy, but sometimes I guess it's on the point. But I guess God has better plans than I do, and no, he does. Uh, but we've had 365 days or down, 365 and a half, and we've got the rest of today, and that's the end of 2017. And maybe you're saying good riddance. Maybe you wish you could go back. You know, it's winter, and we wish we could go back to the summer. You know, I know Mia was already asking when the summer's coming. I'm like, winter just started. You got a little time. But you know, the world can't wait for tomorrow. Can't wait for January 1st to happen. Uh, so much so that people are going to flock to Times Square in the middle of the cold, the coldest cold. It's colder here than it is in Antarctica right now. And they're willing to go stand outside and drink their drink and watch some giant silly ball drop to count down until tomorrow because they're so excited for tomorrow to happen. Uh, and that's kind of ridiculous in my, in my book. Um, maybe I'm just getting old. Uh, but I've seen that there's unprecedented security at Times Square and other venues, that there's threats of terrorism and, and all these acts to attack people, to take away uh, tomorrow from them. Uh, but, you know, people do want to escape the past. People want to start fresh, and, and I don't blame them, and I think that's why they want tomorrow to happen. You know, gym memberships will skyrocket. I remember years ago, Ashley and I got a membership to Planet Fitness, and we went once, and she got a T-shirt. <laughs> and then we didn't go for a while, and then uh, they wanted us to pay, and we still didn't go, and they said, don't worry about it. <laughs> we know, because this happens every year. We're not going to bother chasing you down, because you came here once. <laughs> uh, you know, health food and fitness equipment, I'm sure, big sales this weekend. Uh, you know, I'm sure churches, maybe not so more, but I think maybe more in the past, but churches may get another attendant or two for a little while. You know, I saw a sign, at one of those church signs down the road that said, um, start the year off right. And yeah, I get that. I think going back to church, if you're a believer, you're backslidden to go back to church to start the year off right. If you're not a believer, yeah, start the year off right and go to church. But it's not a work. It's not a resolution. It's not, you know, I'm going to start going to church every day and get my star for attendance. Um, I remember getting saved and I didn't miss church for ages and I, you know. I don't know that I counted to myself for righteousness, but I remember getting sick and missing out on church and being bummed because I missed everybody, but also like, oh man, my perfect record is broken. You know, I definitely didn't have that record in high school with going to class um, or going to school. But after a few weeks, you know, those running shoes, speaking to myself, will probably be right back up on the shelf. You know, the new years, the new thing wears off. And I think that's part of why, it's not the whole reason why, but part of why the Bible says, God says through Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man uh, other than Jesus to ever live, says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And I love the way he says that in uh, King James. It's worded a little interesting. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And that's the first part of Ecclesiastes 7, 8. You know, the beginning is not better than the end. It's not better than the end. In the world's eyes, it is. New is better. Man, that car, that clunker that's old, it's better to get the new one. Uh, I don't know if you saw recently that Apple makes their iPhone slow down after a year, apparently to preserve battery and make it last longer. I think it's probably to get you to want to buy the new iPhone. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be turning around so quick and selling battery replacements. You know, the cost of a new car at, you know, a dealership, or as I like to call them, a dealership, you know, it's so expensive. As soon as you drive off the lot... They depreciate because someone else has driven them. You know, if you buy a year or two older model, maybe off lease, maybe just sat on the lot, you can save a ton of money, a ton of money over getting the brand new one that just came off the truck. Um, you know, I, I'm into cars and I watch shows on cars and they talk about these supercars that were millions of dollars only a couple of years ago or a couple hundred thousand dollars only a couple of years ago. And now you can get it for $40,000 or, you know, still a lot of money, but compared to what it was, it's not the new model anymore. People don't want it. It has 8,000 miles on it. People don't want it anymore. Now, I'm not saying, nor does I think the Bible say, that new is wrong or new is bad. But new is not always better. The world equates new with better. Um, you know, that getting tired of that relationship? Get in a new one. It'll be a better relationship. And maybe it will be better for a while because 
you're not really real with each other. You don't really know each other yet. So yeah, it's better. You put on your good face. You put on your nice clothes. You go to the nice restaurant. But after a while, you're eating off the dollar menu. <laughs> it's not better anymore. You know, because it may just be different at first, but eventually you're going to see it the same. You know, we just got a new TV. I got it refurbished, so I saved money. But eventually this new TV will be my old TV. You know, it's going to get bumped down the line, you know. Uh, just because it's new now doesn't mean it's necessarily better. You know, that new job you want, that you want that maybe you're just about to get, eventually you're going to want to quit that job. You're going to say, why did I ever take this job? You know, the stress is through the roof. Uh, I remember starting off school. I'd be so excited, getting new clothes, lay out my new clothes the night before. Couldn't sleep the night before. And two weeks later, I'm like, where is summer? Is this going to be over yet? You know, it's, the luster wore off. You know, when you're hungry, you can't wait to start eating. But isn't it better to be full than to be hungry? You know, sure, that first bite tastes good, but isn't it better to be satisfied? And that satisfied belly? You know, like I remember the honeymoon cruise, my favorite part was eating, 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 and then getting the bill, and it was zero dollars because it was already paid for. You know, the end of the meal, I think, is the worst part now. You go to a diner, you go to a restaurant, mmm, I'm hungry. Oh, it's $10. Oh, that's no big deal. Oh, $20. Oh, bring the appetizers. We're hungry. And then you get full and you're gorged and you get the bill and you go, it wasn't worth that much money. Now I got to pay it. How much do I have to tip again? You know, I think that's where fast food has the win because you pay up front and then you just deal with the regret of eating it later. If you had to pay for fast food afterwards, I don't think anyone would get it. You know, you'd sell your inheritance for that bowl of soup. That's probably not so good afterwards, right? Or that feeling when you first hit the bed after a long, hard day, it's wonderful. Ah, especially when you get something new, like a new mattress or a new comforter and you lay down. Ah, that feels so good. But doesn't it feel better when you wake up, when you're rested, when you've had a full night's sleep? Yeah, that first feeling is good, but it's not the best feeling. You know, what was that like again? I'm sure that's what you might say is, what was it like that before night's sleep again? But I think even in our Bible studies, it's fun to start a new section, a new chapter. But after we finish a chapter, a book, or a section, isn't it better? Even if we had to like slag through Leviticus and learn all the laws about how many doves you had to kill or whatever back in the day. Um, but we've been edified, hopefully. It's hot. We've had something to take with us to share. Hopefully, all well, we know, God has spoken, but have we heard it? You know, it's better to have the Word of God to remember than to be waiting in anticipation for the next word from Him. A lot of times we just want the next word from God. God, what's the next word? A lot of times believers are like, what's the next wind? You know, what's the next fad to go through the church? Well, how about we just take what God has already given us and lay it to our heart and, and chew on it and, and stew over it and go, hmm, Lord, am I living the way you've asked me to live? Am I doing what you've asked me to live? Because when we stew on that, when we hold on to it, man, it's better. We don't need a new word because that quote unquote old word is a good word. And it's a better word. You know, uh, I think it's Pastor Chuck used to always say that there's no, uh, there's no new revelation. There's no new word, you know. But it doesn't mean that the old word is old. Um, it's good. You know, sometimes uh, we need to repent and do the first works or return to our first love, as Jesus said. Because sometimes we keep seeking something else, something new. And we leave the something better. When things are over, it's better. Whether it's bad or good, the Bible says when it's over, it's better than when it began. And that's, I've wrestled with this verse for years, and I'm not saying that like uh, I'm a scholar on it or anything or that I've reached some level, but this verse has kind of stuck with me for years. It, I know that to be true because the Bible says it, but is it actually true? And to weigh it out in my life and go, yeah, you know what, it is better. It is better. Whether I think it is better or not at first, it is better that it's over. For instance, the new Star Wars movie. I was anticipating it. I can't wait to see it. Oh, Ash, I'm getting all these spoilers. And Ash says, finally, just go. <laughs> just go. Uh, but I was definitely more excited about it before I saw it than after I saw it. Because after I saw it, I go, what? What'd you do? <laughs> I think they did it well, but I don't agree with what they did. So I'm not very happy right now when it comes to that. But there's a million examples. A day, a relationship, paying bills, the work week, the weekend. Vacation. I think, you know, we look forward to vacation so often, but in a way it's better that vacation is over after we've had it because we've had the vacation. We needed it for so long and then, oh, we finally had the vacation and 
And Tuesday we go back to work and it's a dry spell before the next holiday, right? Unless, you know, you're in school and they have holidays for anything. Or right? snow days and you just check in the weather. Um, but the second part of Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, And the patient is spirit. The patient in spirit, excuse me, is better than the proud in spirit. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. I think it's interesting that these two phrases are together. At first, I was just going to kind of cut off and do the beginning half, but the more I considered it, I realized these have a relationship, an important one, especially in the context of that area. Because patience will get us through to the end of something. Pride through impatience is going to have us seek a shortcut. You know, when I shovel the driveway, I don't want to spend an hour doing it. I want to spend a half an hour doing it. So I get two shovels, and I push them both at the same time, and I cover half the ground. <laughs> you know, if the plow was working, I would be out there plowing, but I, it won't turn over. Um, you know, somehow I'll spend hours fixing a plow, <laughs> and that'll never plow the driveway instead of spending the hours plowing the driveway. Because when I'm on the plow, I'm, not, I'm just sitting there. I'm not doing hard work. You know, but pride always wants us to seek that shortcut, a way out. A way out. How often do we want a way out when something's not over, that we want it to be over? Um, something new. You know, we want a way out of the thing old we have. Drive by that lot. Oh, that's new and shiny. Yeah, but it also comes with a big old payment. Or the beginning of something new, or the beginning of something else. Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us, that we need experience to make it through. You know, you might not be able to download book smarts. I don't know if you saw The Matrix, when they taught him Kung Fu, they just plugged him in and they downloaded a file into his brain and he knew Kung Fu. But he still had to go train. He didn't have that experience that, hey, Jacob, you need to go play in your room, Bubba. You know, I watch YouTube videos on how to do stuff. We are watching YouTube videos on how to make espresso or how to fix the car. But until we actually do it, until we actually go through it, we don't yet have the experience. We don't yet know exactly how it plays out. But we shouldn't be just about the experience. And it's not just about experience and having experience. You know, I went to the mall to go see the movie. I realized, oh, wow, all these stores that were big tent poles of the mall are now gone because no one shops there anymore. And when I was at Best Buy yesterday, I saw how many more appliances they have now because now they have the market because these other big boxes closed down. But the mall is becoming a place about going there for experience, going there to have a good time, going there to bowl or play games or see a movie or eat. Um, it's about having an experience. But that's not the experience that we should be looking for as Christians, to go somewhere to have an experience. You know, I think that that's what the church does a lot lately, is go somewhere to have an experience, whether it's an emotional experience, whether the music is really great. So I have an experience in the music but have I really spent time with Jesus? I, yeah, I've held up my phone and I've videotaped this awesome experience. But I have, have I had experience with Jesus there? And not that there's anything wrong with having a fun time or a good time or even a, a well-produced time in worship or in church or in something. But if the experience is not Jesus, then it's just a vain experience. It's no different than what the world gets when the world goes sees whoever the hottest act is or goes to TEDx and listens to the greatest speaker this is no different. It's just some vanity. And we need to experience that only spending time with Jesus brings. And sometimes that spending time with Jesus means we got to spend time with him for months and a job we don't like and a commute that's rough and a relationship that's hard or whatever it is he's putting us through. He wants us to go through that experience that we might gain experience, that we might have that time under our belt. And we don't get that time under our belt unless we put the time under our belt. You know, just because you have Photoshop doesn't mean you're a designer. Just because I have tools in the garage doesn't mean I'm a mechanic. And just because you go to church and have experience mean that you're a disciple, mean that you're a Christian. You know, doing that time can hurt. And a lot of times it does hurt. Um, sometimes it hurts more when it's over than it did uh, in the beginning. 
sometimes going through that experience, we walk away with more hurt than we did before. I mean, look at the Lord. He's in eternity with scars on him forever. He walked away with more hurt than he did in the beginning, but it was worth it. It was worth it. I think sometimes we don't know the full experience that we're going to get into either. Um, you know, I started watching uh, a miniseries on World War II in the Pacific, and, uh, you know, these kids are going to war, and, they, you know, they valiantly want to go and hero heroically want to go. Uh, I also think, you know, perhaps it was something about their rite of passage wanting to go. But then when they get there, it's not what they expected it to be. They land on the beach, and they're expected to get shot at, and there's already their soldiers on the beach. You know, they're already hanging out. And uh, as they get further along to the war, the horrors that are there, it changes them because it's not what they expected. Uh, and, and again, with war, I've never been there. Um, and I'm sure it's way different than I could ever imagine because you don't know unless you've experienced it. Unless you've experienced it. Second Timothy 2, 3 through 6 says, Paul says to Timothy, he says, You therefore, and us too, because it was given to us, it didn't stay in Timothy's desk. It says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. I don't think we quote this scripture a lot because it says we're soldiers. It says that the Christian life is one of war. It's one of hardship. It's one of pain. It's one of loss. But we're good soldiers. We're enlisted. You know, we were drafted in. Um, we are grafted in. But we're in a war. We're God's foot soldiers. And if we're not enduring, we're not getting, gaining ground. You know, there's no shortcut in war. There's always a sacrifice, always a cost to be paid in war. And Paul even uh, likens it to sport. If you don't get the war analogy, maybe you'll get the sport analogy. That, you know, in, in the Olympics, you can't cheat. You can't take drugs. You know, they're casting countries out of the Olympics because they've been doping and cheating. Or uh, that guy on the bike, Lance Armstrong, who was winning all these championships, and it turns out he was cheating for years, for years, and other guys were too. Um, you know, me and Jake have that fishing game for Christmas, and we're teaching them not to cheat because they just want to stuff the end of the, the fishing rod in there. When? Why? They didn't start that way, but when they realized it was hard and it was frustrating and they weren't catching the fish like they wanted to, they started stuffing in there. Like, no, 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 that's cheating. You know, you're not going to learn. That's not the experience that's going to teach you. You're not going to learn that way. And sometimes, all the time, we sometimes have to learn that way. You know, it's been said that, uh, I'm going to butcher the quote because I forget it. I didn't write it down, but it was good the other day. It's about, you know, that failure can be the best teacher. Um, something of that nature. Because until you've gone through and you've experienced what it's like to go through something, you don't know. And then when you go through it, you go, well, I'm not going to do that again. You cut your finger. You go, oh, all right, I'm definitely not going to hold my finger that close to the knife again. You know, hopefully you learn, right? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> If we don't, well, maybe we have to cut ourselves worse next time, but hopefully not. But if we don't endure, who will? If we don't endure for Jesus, who will? The world certainly won't. The world doesn't want to endure anything. That's why everyone gets triggered. Because you say a word that goes against the, what they want, all of a sudden, they hate you. They don't want to endure truth or sound doctrine. You know, there's four types of soil. There's those who uh, the seed was cast by the wayside and the enemy came and picked it up. There's those who have uh, good soil, those who have soil with rocks in it, that when trials come along, they fade. And those who have thorns, when they begin to spring up and, and almost maybe want to bear fruit, cares come in and choke it out. But I don't always know that good soil just comes naturally. I think, especially in this world, in this day and age, good soil has to be tilled. It has to be made good soil. Maybe you can look at a plot of land. You know, we watch some farmers on YouTube, some guys who make farms in the city and stuff. Um, and they find a piece of land that, yeah, you know, it probably would have been a good piece of land, but it's so full of weeds, it's not worth the effort. You know, we're never going to get them all out. We tried, we're never going to get them all out. And maybe that's, maybe that's some people. But I think with the Lord, we don't necessarily start as good soil. God sees the potential in us, but we have to go through hardships in order to become that good soil. He has to rake our lives. He has to till our lives um, to get it up. The weeds need to be pulled up. The, the rocks need to be sifted out. Sometimes there needs to be scorching sun and dry heat and cold endured uh, to make it to the next season. But when that next season comes, that ground is then ready to bear uh, much fruit um, because it gained nutrients in the prior season. It was worked on in the prior season. 
Ecclesiastes 7, 1 and 2 says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. You know, did we catch that? That it's better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of feasting. It's better to go to a place in your private time with the Lord and be upset and be sad and deal with the hurt than it is to go around and act like everything's okay. And Solomon says, because it's the end of all men. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to have a hardship. At the end of the day, we're all going to die. And we need to lay that to our heart. We need to consider that. We need to say, you know what? Hardship is going to come. Bad times are going to come. And that's part of life. And in fact, one day my life is going to come to the end. Because new things in life are never a guarantee. The stock market could crash. Your job may go under before you get the next paycheck or before your retirement. You may never be able to afford that brand new car you want. I've wanted a brand new car for my entire life. Always, you know, I remember in high school going out, going to the dealership and getting flyers. I couldn't afford it. You know, I remember before I got saved going to the dealership and looking at a car and then realized I could afford it. <laughs> you know, like, I can't afford that. Maybe that'll never happen. That's okay. Kind of. That's okay. But no matter how hard you try, that new thing may never come. May never come. But what is guaranteed is the end. The end is always guaranteed. If the Lord doesn't return first, you will die. I will die. Your relationships will all end at some point. If not by circumstance or moving or whatever, one of you is going to die and that relationship will be over. I mean, yeah, you'll have the memory and, and that, but the actual relationship, there's nothing new coming about of it. Now, in marriage, you say, till death do us part because... That's the, that's the goal, to make it to death. And people don't endure that in marriage anymore. You don't endure the hard times and gain that experience to know that person and love that person. People just quit and go to the next person. And they wonder why they're unfulfilled. They wonder why their lives hurt. They wonder why they have to pay so much alimony and their kids are messed up because there's consequence. Now, we see the robot and artificial intelligence revolution. You know, we're going to become obsolete. Truck drivers. Not going to be around too much longer. Service jobs, not going to be around too much longer. Um, you bring in people, uh, even in the economy, you know, young kids, all these millennials, and, and even us, we don't want to do hard jobs or menial jobs. We think we're better than minimum wage at our first than our first job. So who comes in? Im immigrants, whether they're here legally or illegally. It's not the point. Is that they come in and they're willing to do the hard work that we don't want to do because they know what it's like to live in a country that doesn't have all the things we do, and they're willing to do it to make more money. You know, there's some wisdom there that can be learned. You know, I don't know that there would be all these jobs available if we were just willing to do the, the tough jobs. You know, there's lots of jobs uh, in welding or in industry that pay good money, but kids don't want to do them. They don't learn the skills. They're not taught that these skills are good. And so they're getting out of college with a worthless degree. But anyway, we'll never, we won't be young anymore there's never be you know we always try and be younger but we're not going to be young anymore you know the money we once had or spent we're going to lose it and even if we keep it all it'll lose its value because of inflation i remember getting a happy meal i mean a two cheeseburger meal when i was a kid in high school riding my bike in mcdonald's it was 2.99 plus tax 317 in new jersey six cents on the dollar for tax now it's like eight bucks or you know it's twice as much now um i remember i went somewhere and they were doing like a promotion it was like four i was like wow that's a deal but we try to avoid these things. We try to ignore them. But it's always better to face the music. Um, and, I, you know, I don't like saying that because there's things I need to face the music around in my life. But, but why, though? What's it worth? What do we do? Well, don't you just YOLO or whatever the saying is, you know? No, it's better to face the music. Psalm 9012 says, So teach us to number our days <coughs> that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Our days are numbered. Uh, I Googled it. How many days since my birthday in 1981? 13,291 days. <laughs> I felt old before now. I really feel old, but, you know, do the math. But do you and I want to be wise with what's left? Well, that's how we start. When you realize, oh, I've already used half the oil in my tank and it's only December, you start turning the heat down a little bit. You know, <laughs> start saying, put on a sweater, kids, you know, put on your locks because 
You don't want to fill that thing up again. You want it to last as long as possible. You want to get the most for your money, right? You know, because we need to realize that there's no guarantee of how many days are left. I've lived 13,291 days and one way I have to show for it. I may not get another day. And if I don't get another day, I'll probably be a little disappointed because I didn't really make much of my life. I spent a lot of time doing things that weren't worth it. But God's able to restore those years, right? I was able to restore them and make more in one day. Um, you know, think about that guy, that thief who died on the cross who came to the Lord. God made more of him in one day than he did in his whole life. In one hour, uh, he's lived on and been an example to many and brought many into the kingdom by his story. But look at the kids growing. Mia's going to be the number after four in just a month and a half. I can't believe that. Jacob, so big. Alicia, where's the time go? How much time have I really spent with them? What a downer of a message, you say. Why did I come here? This is not what I wanted. Good. Hopefully, prayerfully, we'll let this make us wise. You know, I get ripped on for downer messages sometimes, and I, I get that. Man, I'd rather give one downer message that hopefully leads you to be wise, or at least even if you don't become wise, and I don't become wise, at least we have the opportunity, as opposed to just having a donut on the way out. You know, we have our Brussels sprout message. The more you have them, the more you want of them, I tell you. Ecclesiastes 7, 3 through 4. Not Brussels sprouts. But sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance of the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. I think the world is in a house of fools right now. Everything's going to be okay. Let's not look at reality. We can call whatever we want to call. We can do whatever we want to do. Let's just be happy and have fun, right? That's foolish. The heart of the wise is going, oh, no, this is not good. This is not good. It's not going to happen. You know, you're the guy in the back seat saying, oh, slow down. You know, keep your eyes on the road. Stop texting. But you're wise. You know what happens when you keep doing that. But I want, at least I think I want, I hope I want, to be the old wise man, not the old wise fool. I've been a fool too long already. There's too much fool in me. There's not enough wise old sage in me. I'm growing the beard now that one day maybe it'll be white and people will think I'm wise even if I'm not. As believers, coming to this realization of reality supercharges us spiritually. We come to the realization that our days are numbered, that God is good, but it's better to go to the house of mourning, the house of feasting. There's not much time left. We start to get busy about our father's business, don't we? Just like, oh man, I'm in high school. My mom's coming home in an hour. Let's clean up. Let's get this trash out of here so she doesn't know. And then the fool in me leaves the trash outside thinking I've got enough time to go to IHOP and back. And I get a page. Oh no, she's home. She caught me. <laughs> yeah, page, yeah. See, I told you I want to be old. <laughs> I'm going to be old. It's just, am I going to be wise or not? That's the question. As uh, Sorry. Nothing like a deadline, really, to speed up the process. You know, there's a reason they call it a deadline. Because when it comes, you're dead. You didn't finish that project? You're dead. Maybe you can buy some more time. Maybe you can't. I'm going to quote a movie that I'm going to quote. It's Heat. It's about these thieves, these professional thieves, and one stole from another, and the other one stole back, and he tried. one thief tried to kill him, and he calls him on the phone, and the, the one thief who pulled one over on the other thief says, what are you doing? And then the other thief, Neil, says, what am I doing? I'm talking to an empty telephone. And the other guy, Roger, says, I don't understand. And I'm definitely not as good an actor as Robert De Niro. And he says... Because there's a dead man on the other end of this line. He says, what are you doing? I'm talking to an empty telephone. What? Because you're dead. You know, there's no one on the other end of this line because I'm not done with you. You don't, you don't pull this over on me. And I'm not saying that's the Lord with us, but I think we need to pick up the phone and realize there's a dead man on this end of the phone. That whatever we're doing, we need to put it down and get busy because we're dying. 
And is it worth it? People live their lives in a cubicle. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's what God has for you. But if it's not, don't stay in that cubicle. Get out of that cubicle. Our lives, our frailty, our limited time, our understanding, strength, and stamina, and how they're fading constantly, should all be the alarm clock to wake us up, to get us woke, as the kids might say these days. But what are we doing? What are you doing? Am I talking to an empty telephone? Why are we doing it? Is it worth it? If it's not, figure out how to stop doing it wisely. And I think sometimes that just means stop. Sometimes, you know, when I was smoking cigarettes, God said stop. And, you know, I was trying to do all the other things to quit. And God said just stop. And I finally did. And it was a hard decision because I was weak. But God gave me strength. When you're on fire... You don't got to go do something. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop running around. You know, probably won't be on fire anymore. Sometimes with work, that means give your two-week notice. Sometimes that just means start looking and praying and seeking. And maybe God will change your heart and say, nope, that job is for you. You're supposed to stay there. And you go, but God. He goes, but you got to stay there. But you need to consider it. But when these things begin to wake us up, we need to take them to the Lord. And he might show us. Because otherwise, we're just doing what the world does. Oh, I don't like my job anymore. I'm going to find another one. Oh, I don't like my relationship anymore. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. Instead of realizing, oh, no, this is the right place for me. God does have purpose for me here. Or, oh, no, my time here is up. It's time to go. Because when you realize that and you take it to the Lord, at some point, it'll be time to go. Either that attitude is time to go or it's time for you to go. Because in all honesty, you can either follow him or not. At some point, it will come down to that. You either keep following them from this point on, or you don't. And what's worth more? Disciples being called. They were, I'm sure that they were sitting there, they were fishing, they realized that their life wasn't all that was cracked up to be. They wanted more, they wanted a Messiah, they wanted the truth, and they're busy about fishing in their father's business. And then one day, Jesus comes walking down the road and says, Hey, you guys, come follow me. They say, See you, Dad. It doesn't even say they say see your dad. They just leave their nets and get up and go. Their dad's probably like, what? You know, where are you going? But they knew what was worth more. They knew it was time to go. That their lives that they had weren't worth it. And sometimes it's easy. A lot of times we come to faith. We come to faith when we realize our lives aren't worth it. When we're like, oh, my life is awful. I need something else. And you come to Jesus. And it's like this selfish motive. And yet God uses it. And how often do we come to God and we're like, oh, my life is great, God. Take these great things from me. I might follow you more. I don't think we do that. And yet God sometimes says, hey, I'm the God who gives. And I'm the God who takes away. And sometimes I'm going to take the great things that give you even greater things. But what's stopping you? Are you like the rich young ruler who went away sad when Jesus told him to sell everything? To give to the poor and then come follow him? What could really be worth more than following Jesus? And I think if we're honest, we look at our lives and we go, this is worth more. I've been treating this like it's worth more than following Jesus. And it's not. Hey, Jake, listen to mom. Jacob, go play in your room, buddy. Matthew 6, 24 through 34 says, no one can serve. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For either you'll hate the one and love the other. You can try and please people all day long. One day it's going to come out. You hate one and love the other. Or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or worldly riches. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Do we believe when Jesus says this or we just take this as a nice saying? Oh yeah, I don't have to worry. Or do we really believe it? Look at the birds in the air, he says. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, he will not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? 
For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about his own things. Sufficient for the day is his own trouble. You know, he's got your life in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? But do we really believe that? Not in a testing way, jumping off a cliff. God will save you, you know, because the Bible also says, do not test the Lord your God. But that scripture, Jesus shows us that what? That we have a heavenly father. Do we believe that? Do we believe that we are God's children? We say that all the time, you know, even in some circles of church, we're kingdom kids. But do we really believe that? That God is our father and he's caring for us. And we don't need to worry. And that when we worry, it really reveals that we, we have a lot of worry, we have a little faith. We have a lot of faith, we have a little worry. And I'm not talking blind faith. You know, faith is the substance of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for, right? But we have faith in what God has told us. When we prayed about something that's worrying us and God gives us a word, we hang on to that word. It's not like we're just naming and claiming some random scripture that we want to fulfill our needs, but the one that God has actually given us. But do we believe that? Do we believe that? Now, I'm not saying, and nor is it true, that every day will be a quit your job and go on the road with Jesus day, literally. You know, uh, there was rebuke for believers who did that in Thessalonians. No, get up and get a job and work. You got to eat. You don't work, you don't eat. But today, it might just start out with being to quit relying on yourself. To quit relying on your paycheck and start giving or tithing or whatever. To quit turning to Oprah before the Bible. To quit waking up and not doing your devotionals. To follow him first thing. But one day, I guarantee it, if you're following him in those things, you're following him spiritually, First, mentally and emotionally second, you're going to start following him physically. That maybe you've been praying for X, Y, Z, and you pray enough, you might just wake up one day to find yourself being the answer to that prayer. You might find yourself on that plane to Africa or on that mission to whatever in your hometown. Or you might wake up in your neighbor's, you're not going to hope you don't wake up in your neighbor's living room, but you might wake up one day to find yourself going over to your neighbor's living room. Jacob, go play in your room, bud. Either come sit and be quiet or go play. One or two. Okay, come sit. Okay? You know, it happens in the natural. We talk about going on vacation, doing something, buying something. Eventually it's going to happen, you know? This happened because we kept talking about a new TV and eventually I succumbed and bought it online. Maybe I'll regret it tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> Probably regret it when I got to pay the bill, right? Um... But that, if that happens in the physical, and it's not always a good thing, right? It'll happen in the spiritual. But it's got to be when God says it. And how many times does God have to say it for us to believe it? How many times does God have to say it for us to obey it, right? How many times should he have to say it? Should he even have to say it? You know, the Bible says that God will lead us what? With his eyes. And God doesn't even have to say, go take out the trash. He just looks and we go, all right, Lord. But sometimes he's like, take out the trash, take out the trash, take out the trash. And we go, what? What, Lord? No, that can't be it. It's cold out. No, my hands will get dirty. Go get gloves. You know, there's other, there's other ways to get to be obedient where you don't have to be crazy, but you can still be obedient and do something amazing. You know, do we want to follow him or not? Do we really want to be Christians or not? Do we really want to be like Jesus, like his disciples, like his followers? Do we, want to, do we want to follow Paul as he follows Christ or not? Do we say we want the Christian life in theory, but in practice, we don't want the Christian life? I think that's the problem with a lot of Christians is that they want the name, they want the, the benefits, but they don't want the real life. But if the answer is yes, which I think it is, which I hope it is, which I'm sure deep down, even if we don't live like it, I'm sure the answer is yes. It should spur on our taking on of the spiritual responsibility that is already ours. You know, when I got saved, I realized I had other responsibilities like to pay rent or clean up or take out the trash. Stuff that was my responsibility before I got saved. 
but I didn't do it. And then when I got saved, I didn't need anyone to tell me to do it because it was obvious it was my responsibility. But we may or may not be taking responsibility for it already. But will we remain children? Yeah. Go go in your room. Go play. It's okay. Go play. Come on. We've done it in a couple minutes, okay? Please go in there. But will we remain children? You know, when I was a child, I put away child. I played, did child's things, Paul says. But when I became a man, I put them away. And I don't think that just means video games or riding your bike, even though there's anything wrong with playing them every once in a while. But they're not the goal of your life. They're not the aim of your life. And when it comes to spiritual things, too, I think that we need to put away childish things and grow up and say, I've been a believer for a while, and there's things in my domain that I need to be responsible for. Um, that's not taking on things ourselves that's um, above our pay grade, so to speak. But sometimes I get work, you know. There's a need. There's something. You just do it, whether it's above your pay grade or not, because it's your job. You're an employee, and you want to be a good employee, and you're going to do it. But Paul says in Acts 20, 28 to 38, he says, Therefore, take heed yourselves and all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul is about to go and leave them and go on another trip. He says, The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities. And Paul said, hey, look, I worked. I worked to provide while I was ministering to you guys. And for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way, laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. You know, they loved Paul, and Paul loved them. But it was time for Paul to move on. God was calling Paul elsewhere, even though he was loved there, even though, in a sense, he was needed there, that wolves would come, that people would rise up, to try and usurp the authority that was Paul's and uh, to lead the flock away, but God was still calling him out. But it gave a great opportunity for the gospel to spread, that Paul would go and spread the gospel, the New Testament would continue, but God would also use the people there. He would grow the people there up to, uh, uh, to be leaders and to reach others as well. That God would use the people who were, quote-unquote, left behind to reach more than they already were. And that happens, that grows. Kids grow up and one day... You know, go leave the house. Not me and Alicia, but, you know, my boy is free to grow up and be a man. My girls can't leave. <laughs> but, sincerely, that's growth. That's healthy. Um, but it's not up to us where God sends us. It's not up to us where God sends us. Lord, send me to Hawaii. Nope. Uh, send me here. Nope. Go to here. Uh, do I have to? It's not up to us to go to decide where God sends us, but to what? To obey. Only to obey. Are we not soldiers? Doesn't our general have a better idea of where the front lines are and where our resources, so to speak, are most needed and most effective? Not only for others, but for us as well. First Samuel 15, 22, 23 says, Samuel said, As the Lord uh, as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. That's pretty hard to think that, man, Samuel is saying that stubbornness and rebellion instead of obedience is witchcraft, idolatry. And he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. All Saul had to do was to be king, was obey the Lord. God already anointed him king. God made him king. Saul just had to walk in that. Uh, but at some point, Saul said, now I've got this figured out. God said this, but I've got a better idea, God. I'll sacrifice them. God says, no, no, no. Get rid of them all. And because of that, because of Saul's own doings, not God's design, Saul was removed from the throne and David replaced him. 
You know, it's much simpler to obey. We started to see that with Abram in our study, but it's much simpler to obey. Say that to our kids all the time, you know. You dis disobedience, is this easier? You know, you're in trouble now. You lost this privilege, etc., etc. Wouldn't it just be easier to say, okay, Dad? Okay, Mom? And we always tell them, obedience always leads to blessing. You know, Jesus' last words with his disciples on the earth, on the earth in Acts 1 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you be witnesses to me until Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the end of the world. Um, and, you know, um, for time, I'm not going to read it all, but uh, it's, then he ascends. And they stand around looking up. And the angels come and say, hey, what are you doing? You know, go do what he said to go do. You know, that there were these times and seasons they were, you know, they were curious about when he would come back. But you said, you're not going to know that. Just be patient. Just know that they are coming and be patient. That God will come. God will come. He will come back. He will show up in that experience, in that situation. But we have to wait for him to come. But that doesn't mean standing around and staring up. God, are you going to come? Is this, is this really having faith? I mean, in some sense, you feel like, yeah, I've got so much faith. I'm standing out in the middle of nowhere looking up at the sky waiting for Jesus to rip through it. But is that really faith? No, because you know that when he comes, you're not going to miss him. So you can go about and doing the other thing. Because it's foolish just to stand around. You'd think there was something wrong with me. You probably already do, but you think about something even more wrong with me if I stand around doing that all day. Are you catatonic? What happened? But get busy about waiting for God to work. And I know we've heard that a lot before. But when he does begin to work, when you do see him begin to work, get busy about being a part of it, about getting involved in it. And don't get involved physically until you see God involved spiritually. If you don't see God working spiritually, take your hand away from it. Don't get involved in it. It's not that he's not working, maybe. Maybe it's just you don't see it. You don't know where you fit in yet. And a lot of times we rush in our Christian service because it's got a label, because in the past it was good or whatever the case may be. And then we get involved in it and it's a burden because God never told us to be involved in it. Are you standing around? Are you looking up? Are you wondering what God is doing? Are you not seeing him anymore? God, where are you? What are you doing? We were just talking and you left. Well, if that's the case, get together with other believers pray like they did. They went and they prayed and they continued with one accord until what? The day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit showed up. And then everyone's lives began to change. Because when he does come, watch out. The wind will blow. The fire will fall. And people's lives will be changed. And guess what? It starts with your life. It starts with my life. We want to see God do a work. He's got to do the work in us first. And when he does, it's not going to stop. God's work doesn't stop. No matter what the circumstance says, no matter what the experience says, no matter where we are, what goodbyes we have to say, what things go away or what things die, God doesn't. God continues. God is life. And he's love. And Jesus says, and the Apostle John says in their last words in the scripture in Revelation 22, 8, says, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angels showed me these things. And he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He's saying, Hey, this is it. You know, Don't seal this up. This, this can't wait. This needs to get out. He was unjust. Let him be unjust still. He was filthy. Let him be filthy still. He was righteous. Let him be righteous still. He was holy. Let him be holy still. Because, I inserted that, I am, behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me. There's no time. Jesus is coming quickly. Don't worry about all these other things. Worry about him coming back, so to speak. He says, my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside of the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices, a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. 
Let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, the time is at hand. The end is better than the beginning. Genesis is great, but that's better. The end of the Bible is better because God says it's over, it's done with. There's a new kingdom, there's a new heaven, there's a new earth. There's no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears. But you're here, but you have to be ready. You have to be ready for me to come. You have to forget the things of this life and press on towards the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus, as the scripture says, as we've seen time and time again lately. But the time is at hand, and God is calling us. You know, we have our life's work, but is it just work? Or is it just true ministry? And if it is just work, that's okay. Our life's work, we may never have public, so to speak, ministry. And God doesn't design it to be that way. Our ministry might be within our job. It might be to provide for others. Like it says uh, in the Bible, to work diligently with your hands that you might provide for those who are in need. And sometimes your life's work may just be work and make money and provide for other people. That's fine. That's part of the body. But is it what God has called you to do? Is your job just your dream for your life? Is it just your way of doing things or is it God's way? And again, I'm not saying just to jump up and quit or that work is bad or new things are bad. But really, we need to consider if time is short, what does God have us do with the time that is left? Because that's all we have. We can't change yesterday. We can't really change today, so to speak. But we can change what we're doing later, what we're doing now. Because either way, it's going to be over. One day, whatever you've done, it's going to be over. Will it be full of spiritual substance? Or will it be cluttered with the chaff of busy work? Will you be Mary? Or will you be Martha? I ask, what do you want for your life? What do you want for your life? What do I want for my life? We all want good things for our life. I think if we don't want good things for our life, we're probably just lying to ourselves. You know, people, you know, when you get depressed or you try and hurt yourself or want to kill yourself, it's really... You want something better for your life and you're not getting it. And so you're trying to get something better for your life, whether it's attention or relief or, and I understand that and God understands that, but he's got a better way. But what do you want for your life? I know what God wants. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And we can have life today, even in the midst of bad circumstances, so to speak. Painful circumstances, things that are ending when it seems like our life is ending all around us. Man, we can have real life in the midst of that if we're there with Jesus. If we let him be there with us. And I think that's the real thing. People ask, where's God? Well, he's right here. But do you want him? Do you want him? He wants in. Do you want him in? You know, we don't need to wait until tomorrow. We don't need to wait till 12 o'clock uh, when Dick Clark's party starts. But <laughs> we don't need a New Year's resolution. Because we know they don't work. Have they worked yet? I don't know. If you have one that's worked, you know, consider yourself lucky like you won the lottery. But let this day of the year, this last day of the year, be the last day we're living for anything but who God is and going where, anywhere but where he's going. And then do it again tomorrow. And then do it again the next day. And if you miss, skip leg day, get back up and, and do it again in the next day. Because better is the end of a thing in the beginning thereof. And this is the end of the message, so you can, be, you can rejoice that freedom is upon us. But God, thank you, God, that you love us and that you're with us. And that God, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, that the end of our lives with you are going to be way better than the beginning. Because sometimes, God, like it says in the scripture that people are, are born and things are rough, and it's sometimes maybe better if they weren't born, so to speak, because God, it would be better to not be born than to be born and to reject you and end up with uh, eternity apart from you. So God, use us to bring people to you, God. That it's not us who bring them, but God, your Holy Spirit is the one who's working and moving. God, let us be a part. Let us put up our sails, so to speak, into your spiritual wind and, and blow with you and flow with you and let you guide us. And just as you can't tell where the wind is coming or where it's going from, um, so is the person who's led by the Spirit. And God, we pray that we would go where you'd have us go. 
So you know that tomorrow, the end of the end of this year, 2017, is better than the beginning. And God, we know that the end of next year, 2018, God, we know that you've seen it from, you know it. God, whether you come back or not, God, you know what's going to happen in the next, from here until then. And you say that is better. And you're going to get us through what's coming our way. Thank you for that, God. Let us uh, be a comfort to others. Let our lives, God, be a witness to you that others might turn to you, God, as we lift you up. In Jesus' name, God, bless us, we pray. We love you, God. You are a blessing. Amen.